Uh, we're going to make introductions of the individual speakers, but I think we can all read here, right? So most of the extended uh, resumes are, are in your portfolio, and we'll keep that brief. Uh, the purpose of this session, we're moving on to solutions. Uh, we're trying to find actions uh, that have the positive outcomes, but if we're going to make those actions, how do we base it on the right science, both understanding the science and then how do we translate it? Hey, what does it mean? So that's kind of the focus of this trio, we, uh, excuse me, of this this quad that uh, is up here, and I think they have a diverse background. Looking forward to them. We're going to start with Dr. Jeff Bender. Uh, uh, Jeff is a veterinarian that uh, teaches public health at the University of Minnesota. Has some great uh, uh, responsibilities in a One Health program uh, sponsored by USAID, and, and also uh, brings a different perception as far as focused on worker and animal uh, ag workers' health. So, Jeff, we'll turn it to you. All right, it's a real pleasure to be here, and uh, I'm, of course I will kick all the, the right answers to the, the table. So I'll start off, and actually it's a pleasure just to, to think about the question of, of, of knowledge and translation. So I'm going to focus a little bit, since I'm kind of an applied guy, and so, and then, so my biases will uh, clearly come out in that regard. And so, just to, to clearly state my biases, you know, I'm a, I'm a former hospital epidemiologist. I actually uh, uh, stopped that job as of this year, and I'm also a public health veterinarian. And so as I was pontificating on these uh, questions, there are five areas that uh, um, I kind of enjoy pondering on. And so those five areas are infection uh, control and prevention, and biosecurity, the uh, discussion about antimicrobial use, uh, stewardship programs, uh, education outreach, and then the last one, which actually reflects my current position, is on uh, global policies on, on antimicrobial use. So that's actually what I'm going to briefly make a statement uh, uh, for you on today. So as a hospital epidemiologist, um, I would look at clinical isolates over time. And so this is actually through our dermatology service. and. Um, I apologize that this is a little bit of a data slide, but it, it illustrates the fact that uh, resistance changes and actually creates some clinical challenges uh, for our, our staff and for our clients. It also creates a challenge as a, as a hospital epidemiologist as to do I have concerns about environmental contamination, do I have concerns about nosocomial transmission, how does this affect actually um, you know, our patient care? Uh, in this regard. So this actually serves as a, a good reminder for me uh, as to you know, why this is important. And so that brings me to the first issue is on, on infection prevention and control. It gets into the issue of translation. And so you know, one of the things that um, I want to just emphasize is that uh, we think both that from the standpoint of production and campaign animals, we need um, evidence best practices. Uh, for uh, infection prevention and control. And uh, I think actually the discussion this morning um, you know, uh, from uh, Laura Hicks was really a nice reminder for us where we need to think about the veterinary medicine. Where do we need to move? How do we need to evaluate? How do we need to actually start to, to look at that? I know one of the issues, to give you a practical example, is that um, you know, we didn't have an endoscope cleaner. We didn't have an automated endoscope cleaner. They cost about $50,000. We didn't have them. So how do you clean endoscopes? How do I make sure that I'm not transferring resistant organisms from one patient to another, uh, even though I might wash them? Or so that would be a real practical way. Or if there's new technologies that are uh, occurring in the surgery room, what's the impact on those uh, new procedures on the movement of air, the potential movement of antibiotic resistant organisms into the surgical field? Uh, so those are just some practical issues that we need to wrestle with, that translation issue that we need to wrestle with. Uh, the other thing we need to think about is um, our clinical decision-making uh, process. Uh, when do we treat? For how long? Um, with what? Uh, and in veterinary medicine, we have actually very little guidance uh, in that regard. And in human medicine, we have some evidence. We know that there's a lot of discussion about shorter duration therapies, and that shorter duration seems to be working as good uh, um, as therapies that are longer. Uh, there are a number of treatment guidelines on the human side uh, versus on the veterinary side. There are very few. Uh, and so when you think on the human side, they have guidelines for sepsis and ear infections and bronchitis. 
Um, and clearly there are clinical trials that are documented that. Um, on the human side, we do not. Um, we even wrestle with how long do we, or at what point do we actually provide antibiotics before surgical cut? And there still is a lot of wrestling. Is it 30 minutes? Is it 60 minutes? And so clearly, um, there's a lot more work that needs to be done on a translational side uh, for, for the veterinary realm. The other issue, uh, which leads to appropriate use, and uh, as mentioned on the human side, there are uh, good clinical guidance documents. Um, and again, there's very limited clinical di uh, uh, guidance documents, but I have to give a lot of credit to the National Society for Companion Animal Diseases. They've actually come up with three um, clinical guidance documents. These are consensus documents. These are reflecting kind of a global perspective. And these um, um, uh, represent, in, in a sense, imperfection because we have limited evidence-based data, but they are wrestling with that data to actually provide um, some guidance. So they have one for bacterial and <coughs> one for urinary tract infections in dogs and cats, and then the last one they recently come up with is respiratory infections uh, as well. And so this is a starting point for us to have a discussion about, well, how do we translate our current knowledge and where do we need to base our next um, research, discussion, and, and uh, uh, guidance. Um, adding to that, what I think has been interesting uh, in my discussions with Banfield, for those of you who have a large corporate veterinary clinic, especially for small animal practices, we uh, asked, well, how, uh, you know, how do you use antibiotics? And so in that, they've actually gone even further than I thought they would. They actually said, well, how do they align with the current guidelines that we have out there? And so, um, in look, and this is a report that just came out from their perspective, is that 67% of non-recurrent UTIs, 44% of recurrent UTIs receive the guideline recommended antibiotics. So they're actually wrestling that with their, with their, their group, their veterinary practitioners. They also noted that 80% of their urinary uh, respiratory infections and 22% of their bronchitis episodes were treated according to guidelines. And one of the things that we should be thinking about, just as we, uh, we saw in the presentation on the human side, is, is where can we go, what are the baselines, and where can we go next? So how do we translate this information, this guideline information, to help inform how we educate our veterinary um, students, how we educate our current veterinarians, uh, and um, how can we improve our compliance with what are best practices as well? We also need some additional tools uh, that will help with clinical decision making. And this includes the development and evaluation of rapid diagnostic tests. Uh, you know, this includes also like regional antibiograms and the use of regional antibiograms and how they're being used. Uh, we need to also think about establishing best practices for approved by security and infection control. And I, I want to reemphasize that point because I don't know if we wrestle with that or tar so it's well enough in those areas. We also need to think about supporting clinical tests that might indicate uh, an infection which may be bacteria or maybe not. And I use the example uh, on the human side of uh, procalcitonin use and how um, they are using that as an indicator. Is this a bacterial infection or is this a viral infection? And should we subsequently think about um, similar types of evaluation and tests and how they can be incorporated, hopefully low cost um, um, uh, as well. The next area of translation of research is really under the topic of stewardship, which is really the focus of, of our conversation here. And I was pleasantly pleased and, and, and uh, to see that AABP came out with their stewardship guidance document. And I, um, I just want to read the definition that they provide here, is that stewardship is a commitment for reducing the need for antimicrobial drugs by preventing infectious diseases in cattle. And when um, antimicrobial drugs are needed, a commitment that the antimicrobials are used uh, appropriately to optimize health and minimize selection of antimicrobial uh, resistance. So just to emphasize that other groups are wrestling uh, with stewardship and what it means and then translating that. To take that a little bit further, um, I had the pleasure of serving as a, a chair for a, a, commi a, a committee that looked at uh, core elements for a companion animal stewardship <laughs> program. And uh, you know, these are just some of the uh, recommendations or um, uh, rec uh, that they have provided for how do we actually encourage clinics to set up and think about stewardship um, um, 
from a practical standpoint, and this includes a clinic that might have one or two practitioners to actually more corporate type of uh, clinics. And so this involves basically a commitment from the practice um, towards that appropriate stewardship, a recognition that we probably need to identify an individual that would spearhead this. Um, and I will say that we totally plagiarized the, the core elements from the CDC program. Uh, also, implementing actions to improve uh, antibiotic use, thinking about how we might do surveillance. Now, thinking, of, um, especially with electronic medical records, how can that be used about how antibiotics are used, which ones are used, and also if there's any culture information. Thinking about how we can have measurable outcomes as a clinic uh, as well. And then thinking about how we have uh, resources for education that is geared for not only the veterinarian, but also for our clients in, in implementing that. And this is actually part of thinking about a bundled approach of how do we deal with stewardship more um, widely. And so I have to apply, uh, uh, apply the veterinary community is starting to actually think about these things, how do we actually do this, how do we actually create practical models uh, to give us some guidance. And so I guess to this, um, the questions that might come out is, well, which of these practices work? And um, what's the impact on patient care when we implement these practices? Um, are these uh, cost-effective practices, especially in the veterinary community, we have to think about that. And then also, how do we actually monitor and evaluate these interventions? Are they really working? Are they really impacting overall <coughs> uh, prescription patterns? Um, are we making sure that it's appropriate? And also, are we making sure that our patients are being cared for appropriately? From a standpoint of education outreach, um, how do we measure the acquisition of knowledge in action change in behavior, as we talked about yesterday? Um, there are some new educational tools out there. We highlighted the, um, the uh, USDA accreditation modules uh, today. Dr. Major pointed that out. There are some ABMA uh, client-focused materials. And basically, how do we think about public education about antimicrobial use and appropriate resistance uh, as well. And we talked a little bit yesterday about just uh, the tools that might be, training tools that might be necessary for veterinary schools and how do we engage veterinary schools and my hands off to A, B, and C, taking a leadership role of how do we do this broadly across all veterinary schools. And, and then it gets to the, to the last thing of how do we create actually good public education campaigns and programs. And the last thing I probably want to just take a, a, a time to focus on are, are the issues of uh, the global uh, policies, this reflects my, my current job is basically uh, looking at global workforce development. Um, and this is actually a quote from, from uh, Professor Davies. Um, the need to discover new antibiotics and therapies, and we clearly need, need those, but also a commitment to the resources for preserving the effectiveness of the existing um, antibiotics by reducing appropriate use. And we heard that from previous panels here. I, I just put this in the context of thinking about you know, if we look at the annual estimates of deaths attributed to AMR estimated by 2015, and there's some debate as to, you know, the merits of this particular, these particular models, but the one thing that I wanted to you know, take a look at are the two biggest circles there that represent basically the um, um, mortality per 100,000 or per 10,000 population, and it really focused on Africa and Asia. And we've been having a lot of discussion. The small spot uh, uh, bubble is actually in North America. And so uh, I just want to highlight that these countries in particular have limited surveillance. They really have limited uh, chances to really detect, respond, and prevent uh, uh, multidrug resistant infections. So I want us to make sure that we, we have or are thinking about kind of the, the global nature of this problem. And so one of the things that we talked a little bit about today, or heard some discussion about, is the national action plans that are being developed by many countries. WHO uh, asked and encouraged the development of countries to develop national action plans. And a quick summary of those, 85% of countries have developed or are, are developing national action plans, and these are focused on antimicrobial resistance. 52% of those countries have developed a plan that addresses the one health spectrum. Uh, so clearly 50% have not. And then 52% of low middle income countries have national level plans for infection prevention and control in human health care, but only 7% have national surveillance systems for AMR in animals and food. So I want that uh, reality to sink, uh, to, to sink in that um, we need to be thinking on a global level. 
And then it gets into some of the uh, questions or issues that we have is that we need to think about harmonization of laboratory techniques globally. So we heard a little bit about that today. How do we evaluate the impact of these national plans, especially if you have no surveillance systems in these countries? And then how do we actually document the current and appropriate use in these countries and actually encourage them and actually work alongside them as leaders in this effort, um, especially with few resources and limited data? And then how do we actually monitor or implement um, the education and outreach programs to producers and farmers, especially in these countries as well? So in summary, I just want to say that, uh, again, animal resistance continues to be a grand challenge. It's a global challenge, and we need to uh, apply practical interventions. So focus on this particular session is on translation. We need to evaluate these programs. We need to identify best practices, and we need to really develop key communication messages broadly for practitioners, clients, and the public. And with that, I'll turn it back to the moderator. Uh, thank you, Jeff, and I think uh, for the global perspective, and besides a grand challenge, it, some people would be a wicked problem. So, moving to our uh, next panelist, uh, we're fortunate to have Nora Schrag. Uh, currently, she's uh, a pharmacology resident at Kansas State University, where she returned to her uh, original training, applying her uh, learnings from being in practice both in a uh, global setting, uh, U.S. setting, and back at the university. So, Nora. So that is true. So the, I'll start by making a correction in that description of me in there. I think it lists me as a professor, assistant professor of agriculture practices, and that's what I was doing when this picture was taken, but it's not what I'm doing now. Um, and this whole talk is, is really about the story behind why I've changed. And it certainly was never my intention to leave practice, and it is my intention to go back. But right now, I decided to take a time out and look at this issue a little more closely. And so really this started because as I was reaching into my truck trying to practice stewardship, I figured out pretty quickly that I had more questions than answers. And not only did I have questions, but also I had a bunch of veterinary students with me who had really good questions too. And so we've heard a lot of definitions of stewardship today. I'm going to show you my current one and I'll tell you that this changes usually by the day. Um, but here's where I'm at today. And and really what my challenge was, was trying to figure out how can I do stewardship and what information do I have. So we start with a disease diagnosis and I'll, I'll start by saying that, you know, once we diagnose a back, what we suspect as a bacterial pathogen, um, really hopefully we've done all the prevention we can to get to that point. So we're working with complicated systems. If prevention worked every time, then we none of us would be here because we wouldn't the antibiotics. So just keep that in mind. This is once we, once our prevention tactics have failed, we start with this disease diagnosis. Um, so we enter in the first question is, is there an alternative? And I can tell you that doing mostly cow-calf practice and for beef cattle, if I find an animal that I think has bacterial disease at the moment, I don't have a non-antibiotic alternative that will fix it nearly as effectively as an antibiotic. I mean, that's just where we're at. Hopefully we'll get one sometime, but that's the reality. So then I'm down to choosing a drug. And so I'm reaching into my truck, hoping that I'm making the best decision. At the same time, I'm going back to how I got to this place, trying to do everything on the farm I can to prevent that disease in the first place. And, you know, that's something that we're taught and we're trained to do as veterinarians that it comes pretty naturally. That was not hard. The hard one is do we still need this drug? So figuring out, yeah, we had this disease pressure on this farm. We, this is how we've adapted to it. We treat X percent. Or now we've decided to use this treatment to control this disease. Do we still need it? And I think that's one of the harder ones to get a handle on. Um, if the answer is no, we stop. If the answer is yes, we come right back around the circle. So I ended up asking a lot of questions, mostly about drug choice, because that's what I was needing to justify to myself and to my students. Um, and I guess I asked one too many questions one day because Dr. Adler said, well, why don't you just answer that? And his method for answering that was to stop what I was doing and start a PhD program in a pharmacology residency. So here I am. <laughs> Careful what you ask for. Yeah. So anyway, um, so part of 
our, one of our main projects is we have a cooperative grant with the FDA to look at how would we measure use um, both on beef feedlots and on dairies. I'm the predominant graduate student on the dairy project. Uh, I have a colleague who's working on the feedlot side of it. But in our discussions, we started talking about what what data are we going to capture to try and decide what might be the most useful. So our first choice would be a data that's coupled to cause. Second choice would be not coupled to cause. And we know here that we're balancing the available data with what we like, right? So we made our list of ideals. We could probably deal with it if it's not that. So we want it to be as accurate as possible. Second choice would be approximate. You know, approximate would be better than nothing. We want it to be as granular as it can be. Aggregate would work, but not near as good. We want it to be current rather than historical. We want it to be easy to collect rather than resource intensive. We want it to enable us to benchmark. I think that's one of the things that really helps. You know, when I'm standing at the back of the truck, I think that I'm making the best decision I can. If I have nothing to compare that to, no other practices that are like mine that I can compare my use with their use, I don't have any idea whether I really am doing the best job controlling disease or whether there's ways that I, or mechanisms that I don't know about that I should be looking into. So we want to be enable benchmarking. A lot of that aggregate data or historical data really makes it hard to benchmark. Um, so then when we looked at the reality of the data we had available and what we were going to collect, it turns out that needs to switch. And so if you're the graduate student, the fact that it's resource intensive is not really a problem for your major professors, it's just a problem for you. So um, I've spent a good deal of time traveling. We have 32 <laughs> dairies on this study. I have, well, I guess we're done, I'm done with 30 of them. Um, so we've been on farm collecting data. And what we're doing really is collecting absolutely everything we can collect. And our hope is that in the end, we can look at it multiple different ways and figure out what might be the most useful at farm level, um, thinking that if we get it at farm level, it can be aggregated later. So um, I'm not going to share any actual data with you. We don't have that ready to come out. But I'm going to share with you some of the discussions we've had about how we're going to report it, what we're going to report, it, and some of the complications that happen when we do that. So when we started discussing this, we looked at the literature. It's really a nice review article published in 2016, and it looks at all the different animal curvature use metrics that have been used, both in human medicine and in veterinary medicine. And there are quite a few of them, as you can see, and you know some of them are almost duplicates. But there's a lot of ways to measure it and a lot of ways to look at it. So I'm pretty simple-minded, and I needed to simplify that a bit. So when I really broke that down, most of those are an amount of drug standardized by some population in some time. And so it's about numerate, what you put in the numerator and what you put in the denominator. If we simplify that long list, these are the most common ones used in veterinary medicine. Um, and so you can see this active substance per thousand animals per year. So we've got a measurement of drug in some way, shape, or form for all of these. We've usually got some measurement of the animal population, and we've usually got a measurement of time, even though time's not specifically listed on some of the rest of those. There's generally a time component to them. So when we thought about what we're going to do, we decided that we're going to really look at it at three measurements of drugs. So we're going to look at total drug amount in milligrams or number of molecules. We still have heated discussions about that. I'll come back to that one. We're going to look at the days of therapy, so the days for which we provided an antimicrobial at a dose we think is affecting the pathogen. And keep in mind, this is different than days of exposure. Uh, we've had a lot of discussions about that. Exposure happens long after therapy is over, right? So we could have a very small amount of drug decreasing over a long time in an animal that's not really affecting our pathogen. It's not a level that's affecting our pathogen, but it's still an exposure and it may be affecting other microbes in that animal. And then we have our number of animals treated. So basically, we're going to pick one, put it over some standardization. There has been a lot of argument about standardization. And really, I might change this too. But in my mind right now, we're pretty good at standardizing things in production systems. We calculate all kinds of rates within agriculture. We calculate morbidities, mortalities, feed efficiencies, all of that. So 
I think we can stay, we can deal with how to standardize it. The complicated part is the actual drug measurement. So to simplify things a little bit, I just took a, I standardized by the ranch. So I've got two farms. They have the same number of cattle. They have 100 head of cattle, 500 pound calves, and I've treated 20% of them on both farms. The only difference is one of them chose to use more epoxy tetracycline, and the other one chose to use more telazomycin. So if we compare these two farms by the amount of drug and the number treated in the days of therapy, you can see that it, it's not always the same. So if we start setting policy based on the amount of drug, or we start flagging a farm based on the total amount of drug, we're going to flag farm A as, oh, you're using twice as much as farm B. Whereas if we start looking at the days of therapy or the amount of time that drug was there at a certain level, we're going to say, oh, farm B, you guys really need to change how you're doing things. And really, from my perspective as a veterinarian, I'm worried about the disease pressure. And they really have the same disease pressure. There was the same number of animals that needed treated. So it just, I don't know that one of these is right or wrong, but we need to think about the fact that it does make a difference how we look at it. And even that makes a difference in you know, how I'm comparing, comparing farm to farm. So if we want to make it a little bit more complicated, we could add another drug. We could say, hey, they both treated 20 animals out of 100 heads. They said that's way more than we want to treat. We're going to try and control this disease. So farm A chose to treat with five days of chlorotetracycline. Farm B actually chose to try and control it in the beginning, and they treated from the time those calves got there until 72 days later with a much, much lower dose, but the same drug. So the same drug over a longer time. But if you throw that into the mix, that makes it even more complicated. So in milligrams of drug, they're actually the same. And number of animals treated, they're actually the same. Now, I left the other two drugs on because really the feed use drives this. Um, but they're drastically different in the number of days of therapy. And so we can even complicate this more when we start thinking about, okay, if we don't have the granularity that we want, and we're going from sales data, or we're going from total antimicrobial use, then we're gonna use some standardized things like daily doses to come up with our amount that's been used on that farm. And so if we use the standardized course dose, then we're gonna come up close. Both those farms are gonna be close, but not quite there. As far as, as far as the number of animals treated, if we do days of therapy, the daily dose is gonna be drastically different than reality. And so those are just some of the things we've been thinking about. Um, we've had our own internal discussions over what does total milligrams mean, and I'm not gonna dwell on this too much other than to say that in our heated debates, I think we've concluded that it's a lot like pounds of fruit. So we know that, they're, that oranges are drastically different than cantaloupes, we're not sure which we would rather have in a food fight. The cantaloupe hurts more, and we've got more oranges to throw for the same amount, but here we are. And probably it means something, but just be careful with what it really means. And I'll flip through these and just stop there. Very good. <clears throat> Looks like um, Nora's working aggressively to, to change data to knowledge, so hopefully progress there that way. Uh, our next uh, panelist today is uh, Joe Swedberg, uh, retired uh, from Hormel, Vice President of Legislative Affairs, but he stayed very active. Uh, he leads their um, uh, group that discusses antimicrobial resistance with Hormel, very uh, involved with the philanthropic activity and food security, but also um, is, is chairman of Farm Foundation that has very uh, many activities related. So, Joe. I'm going to continue the conversation we had yesterday uh, when I talked about uh, the work that was done in the partnership with the Farm Foundation and the implementation of Catechus 29213 and uh, the BFD. And I ended up telling you uh, we started a partnership with the Farm Foundation as a few charitable trust. Um, and that's where I'm going to start today. A uh, few was involved in that education project by supporting it with funding. Uh, they felt it was a good uh, effort, and I think the results speak for themselves. But we had conversations after the after this was done, and decided it, it, there's more we think we could do together. We don't know how much more, but we think that the conversation has started. Instead of talking at each other, we're talking with each other, 
and what can we, where can we go from here? So, thus we've started the uh, Farm Foundation Pew Antibiotic Stewardship Working Group. And let me start by saying we don't have all the answers. This is a very collaborative group. We've had four meetings so far, and I'll talk a little bit about those. We started out very slowly. We know we don't have everybody at the table, but we started out purposely with a smaller group uh, to see where this could go. Because we didn't know if we had one meeting, it may be over, I don't know. So that was the start of it. So we had four meetings. We started last December, I believe, uh, with our first initial meeting. Um, in the participation of the meetings, we have uh, major processors and some producers. Uh, we have the major livestock groups, so we're including all the species with those, the major groups. And the pharmaceutical companies involved, and we have retailers and food service operators, some pretty big ones, that have had been a part of this discussion. So that's the starting premise. And that itself was not always easy, just to get people to think, OK, this is an opportunity. Uh, a little nervous about coming to the table. So in our first initial two meetings, the first one was really getting to know each other and getting somewhat comfort. So we got through that first meeting in December. Uh, there was starting to get some comfort, some conversation. Uh, we all agreed, let's have another meeting. There's a, quite a, few, there's a number of you in the room that were in those meetings and still are. Um, and so that was, that was the start. The second meeting, we made more progress. Uh, we started sharing each other's philosophies on stewardship, and antibiotic management, uh, animal welfare, et cetera, which was really important. So the conversation started. Uh, I have to give credit to Steve Solomon, who's here. Steve has uh, been chairing that group uh, and been kind of hurting, as I said the other day, the cats at times. But um, Steve brings a, such a, a diverse perspective and, and has really done a marvelous job, in my opinion, for that. So uh, the initial conversations, I think I could sum up by saying it's, it's really we're talking about shared values and beliefs that everybody brought to the table. And when you start doing that, we really have quite a few things in common. And we may not agree on everything, but we were really focusing on what, what do we have in common and where can this group potentially go? Because we have some really smart people that have a lot of experience in this area uh, involved with that. So it's, it's really talking about your values and beliefs. And I talked about that. It really brings the non-traditional partners together, which it was unique in itself. So, Following the second meeting, uh, we, we started tackling uh, the definition of stewardship for uh, livestock and, and stewardship and antibiotic use. And uh, Steve opened up that uh, initial meeting talking about it took the medical industry uh, 70 years to come up with a definition. And we're thinking we're going to come up with it in a, in a few months. I can tell you today we are very close to a final definition that the group has agreed upon. I'll talk just more about that in a second. So, uh, and I give, I give a lot of that credit. So I think this was really a starting point by taking those shared values and beliefs. And I give Karen uh, Holzer, Dr. Holzer, she's going to be on a panel tomorrow, a lot of credit for uh, taking this because everybody in that group basically had their own stewardship definitions. Many companies do, organizations, uh, the meat producers, cattle, pork, uh, dairy had definitions. What she did was go through each of those and their statements and take out the common terms within those statements where everything kind of fit together. And we put those all on one board. All right, this is the second meeting. And then we started picking those out and how can we put those into sentences. So what we did was take the common beliefs within that group and filter them through to come up with a definition. I can tell you our last meeting, which was about two weeks ago, we had a definition. Um, it, it's always dangerous in a group like that to start wordsmithing. I thought this, okay, this is going to be, you know, we had 30 minutes for it. I thought this was going to be two, three hours or more, we wouldn't get done. 30 minutes, we were done and had a consensus at that point. We're not ready to publish it, but we're working on it. But uh, that's the kind of collaboration I think the comfort has moved forward. So I think that's exciting news about that. Um, and I think that really talks a lot about just having those conversations. This last meeting, we also divided up into working groups now. Uh, a lot of the work was being done uh, through conversations and so on. Uh, Karen was doing a lot of the work. Nora Wong was helping us here, also was helping with that. Uh, we decided to, to break into working groups. And so we have four working groups right now. One of them is actually refining the product. Where do we want to go with this? What is the product we're talking about? 
At our last meeting, we discussed kind of an umbrella of guiding, I don't call them guiding principles within the stewardship definition. What does that mean? What's implementation mean? What are the guiding principles that we could come to consensus with and bring forward? Uh, also, we're working on a subgroup with implementation of that framework. Uh, we've already had some calls on that. Uh, is, there, is there a formalization of the group? Do we, who, who are we missing? Uh, do we formalize this group? And these again, I, I don't have the answers. We're working through this as a process. And I'm not here, that's why I don't have any slides. I don't want you to hold me anything. It's a working <laughs> process. Um, the last thing is communications. Because one of the things that's lacking in this is communications across the board. And, and as I look at research, when I was involved with Hormel and different marketing research we did over the years, when you talk about animal welfare, antibiotics, et cetera, there's, you know, there's a group over here, about a quarter, maybe less, that really you know, get it or on board, this, is, this makes sense. There's another group on the other side where you're never going to change their minds. And there's a big group in the middle of 50, 60, I don't know, 70% sometimes. Those are the ones I think you can get at. And you can start you know, messaging. And what does that mean? How, what do they want to know? Uh, how much information do they really want to know about that? So we're really working on this communication side, uh, and I think that's important. One thing we have stayed away from is the measurement side. That's the 800-pound grill in the room. Because the pork producers are working uh, on that, the chicken folks, the turkey, cattle, et cetera, they have some of the best experts helping them with that. You talked about Mike Appley's helping on the cattle side. You have Randy Singer from Minnesota helping on the poultry side, you have Peter Davies from Minnesota helping on the swine side. They're working directly with the FDA, and I think in our second meeting we brought in uh, the FDA and USDA was involved, we don't want to let them know what we're doing, they're not directly in the meetings. But we know the work is being done, it's a very complicated process, those groups are communicating with each other, but we didn't want to step in the middle of that because that's a work in progress, and I think that's important to respect uh, that work because it is quite complicated. So we have stayed away from that. So let me kind of give you my overall editorial assessment today on this. Um, I said, first of all, I think it's most important we have a lot more in common than we do differences to get everybody in the room. Um, we're showing, I think, that collaboration can work in conversations rather than talking at each other, we're talking with each other. Um, it's obvious that, that there's a lot of good work taking place out there right now. But it's kind of in silence. It's not being communicated as well as it could be. Does this group have an opportunity to start <laughs> communicating out that here's what's happening? There's some really good work going on. It's a complex issue to start doing some education around this, that things are happening with this, and, and we can be uh, of value with that. Um, also, can we, can we get a united front uh, from this group? I think that's for obvious reasons. Angie mentioned it yesterday. You know, if, if we come up with this, this framework and this uh, sustainability state, I don't care who has ownership of that, if this makes sense to people, it can work. And then there's that umbrella of implementation. Can that, can that start the basis for maybe it's an audit system with that? Because from a company's perspective, we all get audited by different organizations, our, our customers and so on. Is there a standard audit process that can be put in around the stewardship model? That's, that's part of the opportunity here. And I think uh, overall, it's, it's a, a very complex issue. We know that. And the education, and, and education to what audiences, what audiences can we get to to help them understand and at least know that something's getting done. Many times from the consumer side, um, they don't want all the details necessarily. They want to know that you care. They want to know you're willing to have a conversation, a two-way conversation for us not to preach at them or back and forth. We want to have a conversation with each of them. And we know that there's concerns. Here's what's being done about those concerns. Here's the type of work that's being done. Here's the type of groups that are doing this type of work. And I think that's, that's the big essence of this whole project. So again, no slides, it's a work in progress. Um, I continue to be very enthused by the, uh, the work that's getting out and being done within this group. I think after the first year, our, our next meeting is in January. I think shortly after that, if, if all things go as I hope they are, uh, you'll start seeing some, uh, some actual product coming out of that work group. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joe. Uh, without slides, you painted a very good picture uh, of what collaboration and the magic there. You know, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Uh, our final panelist in this group is uh, Dr. David White. Uh, 
uh, David comes with us with his current uh, position at uh, uh, University of Tennessee where he works with multiple stakeholders in research and development and trying to understand the issues and, and pull together and be coordinated. Also, he has an, a strong background on the regulatory side with his previous history with the FDA. So, I'll turn it to you. Great, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in this panel and uh, to be at this meeting. I greatly appreciate the invitation. So, I'm going to wrap this up, I think, today, if I don't blow everybody's ears out. Um, again, talking about One Health, we, I think we're all very familiar with One Health, and if antibiotic, doesn't re antibiotic resistance doesn't epitomize a One Health approach, please tell me another subject that that does more so than this. So I kind of want to walk us through building the perfect One Health AMR intersection, and that's a play of words because we're the last slide is going to say maybe that's not the best approach uh, is an intersection. So in terms of our panel, we were asked two questions. One, are, what are the major gaps in knowledge or translation regarding antimicrobial resistance? And secondly, how do we find the answers to what we don't know? So it kind of builds on the previous sessions that we've talked about today and, and also yesterday. So I'm going to try to focus on these two areas and uh, we could talk for days on these major gaps. There's still a lot of information out there that we don't have a lot of um, data on. So if we focus on the first, what are the major gaps in knowledge of translation, uh, the first thing I'm going to throw out there is, is the resist ohm. Now I think you've heard of all these ohms and omics and I wanted to put this out there because I don't think this has been defined yet. So the resist ohm is essentially all antimicrobial resistance genes and their precursors not only in pathogens, but non-pathogenic bacteria, including those organisms that produce the antimicrobials themselves. So it's essentially all resistance genes on this planet. It's immense, it's unbelievable, and they're ancient. These are not things that have just developed over the past 20 years. They've been there for a long time. Now, we've amplified the selection pressures, so that's why we find these resistance genes more and more. But they've been there a lot longer than we have uh, as, as a, a, you know, civilized humans. And uh, so we have to be aware that the resistome is very, it, it's overwhelming in terms of, of what we have to deal with. And another term of an ohm is something called the mobile ohm. I'm not sure if people have heard of the mobile ohm, but it's essentially the resistome that's mobile. And a lot of these resistance genes are transferable from one organism to another. And that's really the bane of our existence right now in multi-drug resistance, is the transfer of these resistance genes from one organism to another. So genes move laterally through the resistome. And if you can see here, again, you've all heard of the microbiome, the resistome, the mobile ohm. There's probably going to be a several more ohms by the time you know this year is over. Um, but they move back and forth between the normal microbiome, meaning your normal flora of your gut, your respiratory tract, your nose, you know, you name it, your skin, between pathogens, uh, normal flora, and those also those soil organisms. If you think about like a streptomyces that produces streptomycin. It's not suicidal, right? It's not going to produce an antibiotic that kills itself. It has to have genes that protects itself from that production of that antimicrobial. And most of those soil organisms that produce antibiotics, they actually have these genes that have been usurped by other pathogens over time and have put into these clusters on these mobile DNA elements that have, like I said, have, have really caused this multi drug resistance. So it's really interesting. And uh, for those of you thinking of going into microbiology, you need to because we need more people in this area because the genomics of this is just, it's, it's tough to wrap your hands around sometimes. So when we look at the mobile ohm and the resistome, this is a nice, a nice figure that kind of shows the linkage, the arrows going clockwise, but you could argue that it goes counterclockwise as well. You have those microbiomes in the soils, in the fields, in the water. And I think about manure plants, water sewage. I was at a meeting in Michigan State a couple months ago where they were talking about what's happening in China, where China has over 3,000 manufacturing plants for antimicrobials. And over half of those are directly discharging into the waterways. Think about what's happening for selection pressure in those immediate areas. It blows your mind. As a researcher, I'm like, this is fantastic, <laughs> right? And as a public health person, I'm like, this is horrible. This needs to stop, and there's no regulation. And what happens with antibiotic resistance, if you think about it, it's a societal drug. What happens in China does impact what happens here in the United States. It's not like you take a high blood pressure drug, it's not going to impact me. When you take an antibiotic or it's used in an animal, in the environment or a person, it can impact others. So then you have aquaculture uses in Southeast Asia and South America, what's happening there. You know, FDA doesn't really look for resistance in um, 
bacteria and sequel, they look for drug residues, and you can look at those, and some of those residues are, of course, are to drugs that are illegal in this country. Uh, and then you have the outpatient in a hospital environment, where these, these microbiomes are being shared, the resistance genes are transferring back and forth. And there's a lot of papers in the literature showing shared resistomes and shared microbiomes between the environment, uh, humans, and animals. So we're going to see a lot more of those papers. Uh, now, there's no epidemiology to support that, but the genetics supports that the genes are indeed the same and they're being transferred among these different populations. So the major gaps from a research perspective is, I always ask myself, how do these resistance mechanisms evolve over time? You know, were they always out there? Were there a mutation? Did something happen where they now were put on uh, another uh, piece of DNA that's another selection pressure is happening that? There's a lot of diverse selection pressures out there. It's just not antibiotics. It's heavy metals, especially in the environment. There's a lot of heavy metals out there, a lot of heavy metal pollution. Uh, that picture on the right is a plasmid uh, that was um, described in a paper this summer from a salmonella. Salmonella, Indiana, recovered from a chicken carcass in China. That plasmid coded 30 resistance genes. I should repeat that, 30 resistance genes on one piece of DNA that's transferable. And that's from China, but if you look at CDC, they've been reporting an outbreak of backyard poultry flocks. <laughs> Guess what one of the salmonella serotypes is that you see in that salmonella Indiana. Not that this obviously will be here, <laughs> but this, this plasma also has several uh, heavy metal resistance genes. So what's the true selection pressure? You know, my question is, how did, this, how did this get created? It's got resistance genes to every single class on there, and ones that salmonella are intrinsically resistant to as well. So that's a good question. How is resistance transferred and how often? Uh, again, there's a lot of uh, research uh, in mobile elements. These are the, you know, the, the pieces, the DNA fragments that can move across different bacteria. And again, the gene linkage, I find that fascinating where you see these, oh my god, are you kidding me? <laughs> Was that planned? <laughs> you know, no, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> My HVAC at home in Tennessee has gone down, so we have a, a person there. Uh, you don't need to know that, sorry. Uh, What's her name? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we've heard about, again, microbiomes. Um, you know, what is the contribution of the normal microbiomes to resistance? And we've heard about disruption consequences. What happens to your normal flora when you take an animal microbial? We know about C. diff and what happens. But what's happening to those innocent bystanders? Again, a lot of in, in vet med, they're targeted to a, a respiratory pathogen, but you're seeing impacts on the gastrointestinal tract and what's happening with, with a lot of the bacteria there. I think um, uh, we heard a little bit about the PKPD. I'm not going to spend too much on that, but there's still a lot of research I think that needs to be done on the appropriate uh, pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic parameters, uh, depending on the, on the animal and on the species. You know, the dose, the frequency of dose, the administration, the duration. Uh, obviously, what we were trying to do is optimize therapy while minimizing resistance development, and I don't think that was ever the, you know, the target when uh, these drugs were approved um, through the FDA years ago. They weren't looking at minimizing resistance development, so that needs to be, I think, looked at these days. Oh, my God. It's embarrassing. I apologize. Shut off. <laughs> Uh, one other area that we've talked about a little bit, but I think needs to be really uh, greatly uh, enhanced, is the environmental dimension of antimicrobial resistance. We have a lot of people here from the human health side and the animal health side, but the environment is where a lot of these reservoirs are out there. And there's a lot of uh, anthropogenic impacts in soil and water, and we need to take a look at that, what's happening, and how that's impacting these reservoirs of resistance genes and reservoirs of resistant um, bacteria. What can be done about it? You know, again, this falls outside, I think, of FDA and USDA's bailiwick, it's more EPA. And how do we bring them into this conversation? And, and, uh, adding on that, what are the niches where pathogens and environmental organisms coexist? We see a lot of, remember, a lot of the, for these, these genes to transfer to another bacterium, they need to come in close proximity to each other. So there's obviously some mixing ball happening where environmental microorganisms are coming into close proximity to a pathogen. And there are plenty of examples where this has happened. For example, the CTXM beta-lactamases, if you look at the genetic content of those in gram-negative pathogens, they're almost exactly uh, what you see in a, in a uh, bacterium called Pluvera, that's a chromosome beta-lactamase. And what's happened is that gene was captured and put on a mobilizable plasma and is now uh, all through the um, uh, 
required negative pathogens, or the human R genes, which are the uh, transmissible fluoroquinolone resistance genes. They originated, it looks like, based on gene content from, from um, aquatic bacterial species, Vibrio, Schwannella, and Aeromonas. So there's a lot going on in the environment, I think, with gene exchange that we just touched the tip of the iceberg on trying to figure that out. So how do we find the answers to what we don't know? It's a great question. I think, uh, and this builds on some of the action plans that are out there. First, we have to strengthen the knowledge base. I think we have to identify and prioritize data gaps. Uh, in multiple areas, and they all have to come together. Research, stewardship, I think I've hit every single word here, I hope. Infection prevention and control, diagnostics, product development, alternatives, surveillance, outreach, uh, national policy guidance, as well as risk analysis. I think the uh, risk, risk analysis guidelines out there are always looking at microbial risk analysis. But what happens if we, we really start looking at the genes? That's a, that's a new paradigm in how we look at risk analysis. Uh, I think we have to share online priorities where possible. We need to publish findings to various audiences in a timely manner. I think Joe built on that a little bit. Um, we're not taking advantage, in particular from where I'm sitting, the land-grant extension systems. And we have a lot of extension programs across this country that have great collaborations with not only veterinarians but with producers and also with consumers. And we need to tap those extension programs to get involved to help us a little bit with what's happening here. And we've got to use data to formulate science-based public health policy. We have to develop the metrics for success when we do institute regulation. And I think we need to build in you know, checkpoints to reevaluate over time. Where we can seek international harmonization and coordination. And we need to coordinate and direct resources collaboratively, which is really important. And lastly, I think finding the answers is kind of what's come out of this meeting, and I hopefully what will come out of the FFAR meeting tomorrow. You have the USDA that's here as well is we have to create strategic public-private partnerships and coordinated roadmaps. And when I mean public-private partnerships, I mean to be inclusive of, of all groups, you know, not just the federal government or industry, but universities, consumer advocacy groups, and consumers. I mean, we have to bring folks together, I think, to bridge these different sectors and disciplines. It has to be transdisciplinary in nature because not one group has the answers. <coughs> we need to strengthen the partnerships and leverage resources across all these different areas Look at global consortiums where appropriate. As I said, this is not an issue that's solely in the United States. This is across the world. We need to work together. Uh, obviously, develop funding mechanisms. We need dollars and resources to support this. Who is going to fund it? That's a big question. And action plans. Again, we have a lot of action plans, but we really need to move, as I'm saying, and move knowledge to implementation. Right? We have a lot of action plans, but what are we doing with this information? Who's taking a look at all the publications out there and putting it all together so we can have a mitigation strategy? I would argue that it's far and few that we're doing that. So to end up, uh, again, I talked about building a One Health AMR intersection. Uh, here's a couple pictures I got on the internet. Some of these intersections don't work, all right? So I'm going to say, no, we don't want to do intersections. And again, this is just a kind of a play on words here. But I think what we need to build is a One Health AMR roundabout. And I found this picture from England which is one of the biggest roundabouts, apparently, in the world. And it's, a, it's much more effective in disseminating uh, traffic in this way than the intersections. So with that, that's where I'm thinking we should need to go is more of a One Health roundabout. And uh, thank you for your time. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> uh, uh, thanks for uh, adding clarity and, and completeness there, but also uh, uh, demonstrating how you not let the noise and other distraction of the urgent keeps you away from the goal. So very good. Um, excellent. Time for a couple of questions. Very good. And, you know, we've got a new ohm, uh, back on time ohm, so we can have some opportunity for questions from the group. Uh, I see one in the back. Thank you. And first of all, I want to go back. I'm not sure where Rick is sitting. Who uh, shared the last panel. Rick, I want to thank you for the comment that you made in your opening about how do we take a very important medical tool and turn it into a, a marketing chip because uh, uh, we've heard a little bit about that the last day and a half and I think that's something very important to keep in mind as we continue this discussion to not let, uh, uh, to, to not let us lose sight of the goal and I understand marketing is an important part and everybody wants to differentiate their product in the marketplace but um, let's do that for the right reason and not because of bad advocacy or for <coughs> public policy because when we get those combined together, we end up down a road that we don't want to go and we swing the pendulum too far. So Rick, I appreciate your comments that you made opening up the last panel. 
Uh, my question is for Joe. Uh, Joe, you mentioned uh, in the title of this uh, discussion is, uh, you know, find, answer, find out answers we don't know. And uh, we certainly want to find out those answers. But you also mentioned in your presentation the importance of, uh, of values and beliefs. And uh, if we're truly going to address the problem, we have to do it with an open and honest dialogue. You mentioned, and this might come across a little bit critical, and if it does, I apologize, but I think it's very important. You mentioned that you partnered with the, uh, the Pew Charitable Trust Foundation. They have been known to be pretty negative in their values and opinions of, uh, of live, excuse me, large livestock operations. And how can we partner with groups that have negative opinions of an impacted industry if we truly want to get to the results that are important for the overall goal of reducing antibiotic resistance? We have to go in with open minds and open beliefs and open opinions rather than negative ones. And when we partner with those that have negatives going in, chances are we'll have negative outcomes for an impacted segment of the industry. I'm curious as to your comments. Sure, thank you. Very valid question. Uh, so let me go back probably two and a half years ago, maybe three. Um, we were in Tucson, Arizona for a Farm Foundation Roundtable. And the Pew Charitable Trust had just brought in some uh, new team leadership in the area of antibiotic resistance. Kathy Talkington came in uh, from a different uh, organization. And Kathy and Karen Holzer, Dr. Karen Holzer, who was with, our, uh, with them, I think joined, I don't know if they were fairly same time. So they had new leadership coming in. And we met in Arizona. And we talked about the work we're doing with uh, FDA and USDA for implementation of guidance 209 213 of the And during that conversation, we had exactly almost what you talked about. I think I brought up the fact that this hasn't been exactly a collaborative working relationship. We've been talking at each other rather than with each other. And at that time, I, both Kathy and Karen said, uh, we'd like to change that. We think we can get more done working together and finding common ground, common values and interests than we can uh, on the other side. You gotta give Pew, uh, Pew credit, look at the, the scope and scale and, the, and, and what they've done. They've been very involved in the human side of this, but they're involved in a lot of other things. They have a, a bully pulpit. And so we thought there's an opportunity to start working together. So this has been a process going on three years now. And during that three years, I can tell you that they have uh, been very collaborative, uh, supportive. I can share, maybe Carol will talk about this tomorrow, most recently, the National Pork Producers Council uh, and the National Pork Board invited Karen to come to Des Moines and spend the day with them and go over their stewardship policies and go over their welfare policies. Uh, the National Turkey Federation uh, had did the same thing she came in. She came back, I was on the phone in a conference call, she was so excited and enthused by the opportunity to have a conversation with them. So you gotta start somewhere. And this has been a three year process. And so far, in my opinion, um, and I think the opinion of some of the folks that are in this room that are a part of this, it has been very positive moving forward. I can't guarantee it's gonna continue down the road. I think it is, I think we're in the right process. But this is an opportunity for non-traditional partnerships and people can change, things can change, and I think we, they realize, as we realize, we can get a lot more done together than we can doing in opposite directions. Thank you, Joe. So you're looking for progress and solutions together. Yeah. Hi, Jeff Watts with OS. So my question is for Jeff Binder. So obviously from your talk, there's a need for building out infrastructure, uh, particularly in the <laughs> and I wanted to get your thoughts on the potential role of rumen-like organizations in developing and delivering those sorts of uh, uh, infrastructure. I think that's a good question. Actually, it goes a little bit on what Joe was just saying. How do we actually uh, create opportunities of uh, bringing consortiums together. For those who are not familiar with the Rumor organization, this is a, an organization that's based out of the UK. They brought a number of folks uh, across multiple sectors together to basically look at how medicines are used and then basically the response when there are issues that come up. And so I think especially when we think, 
think about the call for national action plans across the globe, um, we need to provide some guidance, provide some directions. And I think room-alike organizations are potentials for uh, that collaboration, that collective bringing together. In fact, I think they might leapfrog how we have been doing this work, we've been struggling. And in a sense, I think that provides a nice platform to basically ensuring or engaging how do we actually bring people together, facilitating conversations so that hopefully they don't have to go through the same headaches that we did, you know, 20 years ago. Some leapfrogging. Question. Hey, I'm Sue Duran. I'm a pharmacist at Auburn Veterinary College. And uh, <clears throat> I'm a human pharmacist. In veterinary medicine, we don't have sterile products rooms. And so one of the big concerns that I'm seeing and an increase in allergies is, um, I don't know if you're aware or not, but both the penicillin and tetracycline are on the hazardous drug list because of allergies. And it only takes uh, 10 international units for an anaphylactic reaction. And I work with Occupational Safety at the University, and we have an increase in producers and veterinarians who have very sensitive allergies now to penicillins. They're mixing things. And so um, I really want to emphasize as producers that you, the drug companies furnish some very good information and, and print some of these client information sheets so that you can educate or use closed system uh, plugs to actually mix these drugs because this is a huge issue that we've seen in the last six years. Uh, and so if you're allergic to penicillins and tetracyclines, that also takes out a large category of therapy if you get sick yourself. And also Dr. Package talked about food animal, but I'll tell you the question yesterday was, are the veterinary colleges educating the students? They spend a lifetime and they have committees with the pharmacists which they actually review and discuss. And when they come to the pharmacy in some of these high potency antibiotics, uh, we have to have a culture and sensitivity before we'll use them. So there is a tremendous effort to work at with that area. And also send home the dog and cat information because over the years, uh, people sleep with their dogs and cats now, so the microbiota, when they're on antibiotics, you've got to educate people that they cannot uh, handle those animals while they're on these animals. Thank you for that information. Do we have time for one more, or where are we at? We're done. I guess we're all done. Uh, so, uh, again, in the, in the opportunity to get back on schedule, which I think we are now, uh, uh, we want to thank our panel. Let's give them a nice round of applause for their openness and willing to share.